Hey, welcome everyone. We're live here. Welcome to Keto Chat for Women. Keto for Women 40 Plus Made Easy. I'm excited about this episode. Hey, I probably said that every time, right? I'm excited. This one actually is a topic that was a request, a friend of mine, Facebook friend, requested this topic. So that's what makes me excited. Also, it's something that I can talk a long time about. So lots of information here and I can't wait for you to learn it. So how to eat all you want and still lose weight. Are you struggling to lose weight because you can't control your appetite? Do you wonder if there is a way to eat all you want and still lose weight? Is there a way to naturally tame your appetite so that you can feel in control of what you eat? Well, stick around. This episode is for you. I'm going to be covering, what did I say I was going to cover? Uh, I'm going to give you the nine different things that contribute to appetite, overeating, cravings, and uh, I'm going to give you a five-step approach to be able to naturally regulate your appetite. And what did I say about that? Yeah, uh, five, the five-step five, five formula to uh, hack your appetite so that you can eat as much as you want when you are hungry, feel satisfied, and have control over food like never before so that you can naturally lose weight. So are you ready? All right, this show is interactive, so if you're watching us live, please share a comment. Let me know where you're joining from. I'd love to know that you're here with me. I can see we've got some live viewers. So um, uh, welcome to the show. I am your host, Carol Freeman. This is episode 59. Forgot to say that. And uh, I have a master's in nutrition and a clinical health psychology. I'm also a certified clinical hypnotherapist and a board-certified ketogenic nutrition specialist. I'm a keto coach near you that specializes in helping women 40 plus follow a keto diet for sustainable weight loss and the medical disclaimer to make, you know, whoever happy. Uh, this show is meant for educational entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice nor intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any condition. If you have any questions or concerns related to your specific medical condition, please seek out a qualified, your personal health care professional. All right, I got a lot. I got a lot to teach today, and this was a really fun topic again to have to go into for me because it just really it reminded me of how much I've studied and learned about basically this whole topic about appetite regulation in our body and how to harness the things that I know in order to help people actually lose weight and not have to count calories and feel like they're starving all the time. And so, um, I'm going to start out by top talking about. Uh, so we're going to do the nine different things that play into appetite. And our, you're going to find out our bodies are super complicated. So these are the nine things I'm going to talk about, but I'll guess there's probably like a thousand, a million different things that actually affect appetite. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything, um, but I'm going to be covering the things in relation to uh, women that would like to be able to lose weight without feeling like they're uh, starving all the time. And so let's just start out with some, uh, some uh, definitions. Then we're going to talk a little bit about hormones, blood sugar roller coaster, weight loss, how weight loss actually increases your appetite and hunger, sensory stimuli and our willpower, habitual patterns, I like to call them like autopilot routines, how mirror neurons affect your appetite and behavior, the, the uh, dastardly combination of highly palatable foods, what that is, what how to avoid that, why they make us overeat refined foods, so like refined processed sugars and carbohydrates, and then how different macronutrients affect our appetite as well. And all right, so definitions, we're going to talk about hunger, satiety, craving, and appetite. So hunger, I mean, you maybe feel like, oh, I know what those are, Carol, can you just skip to the good part? Uh, just for baseline definitions, hunger is the urge to eat food. You feel hungry. And then just to differentiate between a craving, so craving is also an urge to eat food, but craving typically, the way you can dif differentiate that is a craving often will seemingly come out of nowhere, whereas hunger will gradually increase over time. Craving is typically for a very specific food, and hunger is a sensation that pretty much anything will do. So sometimes you have trouble distinguishing between a craving and hunger. Uh, you could do the uh, test of like, uh, could I eat a chicken breast right now? Could I eat a burger patty? Could I eat a, a steak and broccoli? Um, if you say, yeah, that sounds really good. That's probably hunger. If I say all those things, you're like, nah, that's not it. That's not it. Um, craving also typically is going to be for something that's 
high in sugar and or high in fat. And it's typically not something that you're going to be saying is like, oh, this is this is really healthy and good for me. So those are some differentiations between those two. And appetite is just the level of uh, hunger that you experience, how much you desire to eat, um, the desire and drive to eat uh, on an ongoing basis throughout the day and day to day. And then satiety is the feeling, I feel satisfied with what I'm eating and I want to stop eating. I don't have any more hunger. So satiety is the opposite of hunger, opposite of craving actually too, and really the opposite of appetite. And so satiety one of the really cool things about the work that I get to do that I've experienced it myself and all my ladies is that when you follow keto correctly, the way that I teach how to do it, you often, my ladies are experiencing satiety for the first time ever and something different than they've ever experienced. Now, I remember way back nine years ago before I found this way of eating and, <coughs> excuse me, um, and I would pick a restaurant based on which one had the largest portions because I wanted to make sure I got full. And if it wasn't a large pile of food, I knew I was still going to be hungry. I was still going to have an appetite left of wanting to eat more. And so I would base the choices of my meals based on volume. And when you get into ketosis, your body gets good at burning fat as it has stored. And it can actually go a long time without eating. And then you also upregulate a bunch of different hormones, which we'll talk about next, hormones that actually signal satiety. And so this is kind of key. If you're struggling and feeling like you just never feel satisfied, you that appetite never turns off, then likely you're struggling with some hormonal imbalance as the a bunch of different hormones that regulate appetite uh, and satiety. So we have hormones that make us feel hungry. We have hormones that make us feel satisfied and they're different. And so if you feel like you eat, but you never, ever feel satiated, you never feel satisfied, it's typically an imbalance in your hormones. And so I'm not going to go through, again, I could, we could be here all day, all night, hours and hours if I wanted to go in depth in all these subjects. I want to just give you the highlights so that you understand the topic. And then when I make the suggestions, the five steps, I'm going to recommend that you have the basic information to of why I'm making these recommendations and why they're so important. So I'm not going to list off all the different hormones that come into play in our body for hunger, uh, appetite, and satiety. <coughs> Excuse me, but just know that the things that I'm going to talk about here will affect. I'll talk about how they affect um, hunger and satiety hormones. And so, again, I'm not. I, we can mention a couple of them, but also there are so many and it's so complex, we could be going down a rabbit hole of uh, biochemistry here. So just know that there are hormones in our body and that's what's driving um, your appetite, your hunger. And also when the hormones kick in, that's what makes you feel satiated. You feel like, oh, I don't want to eat anymore. And so again, on keto, because it helps our body be able to get fat. It, we're a fat burning machine. We're burning our own fat that we have stored in our body and also then that fat that we've we've eaten. And that actually helps the research shows that it upregulates the hormones that make us feel satiety. And so this is a really cool thing. And again, often it's something that my ladies have never experienced. I'd never felt that before. Again, I would go to a restaurant, what's going to have the big volume? I was worried. I legit would worry I'm not going to be uh, satisfied after a meal, if I was going out to a restaurant or making something for myself, or also if I went to somebody else's house, I'm like, am I going to be able to get enough to get that satiety? But the cool thing is, is that the hormonal trigger of being in ketosis and also the fat that we're eating upregulates those hormones of satiety. And so it's a different level. It's a different type of thing than it ever experienced. And it actually helps you feel this like you finally have control over your portions. You can eat a smaller portion of food and feel really satisfied and not want to eat anymore. So it's really, really hard unless you've experienced it to understand the feeling. And so if you're somebody that's experienced this, you know, give me a, uh, a, you know, a thumbs up or something like that as far as like, yes, you've experienced this. And it was something that was very hard to understand or believe was true until you experienced it. Now, Okay, so hormones is number one. And again, I've got, let me make sure I got them right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, nine different categories of things that we're going to talk about that impact your appetite and hunger and satiety. 
And so hormones is number one. And number two then is going to be a blood sugar roller coaster. So when your blood sugar is crashing, um, there is a book, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the book right now, but basically some research that showed that one of the things that cues hunger that makes you really hungry is a large drop in blood sugar. And so if all day long you're eating high carb refined meals, your body's not actually able to be fat burning. It's not able to access its own fat for fuel. It's not burning fat primarily, and it's relying on burning carbohydrates. You're going to end up on this blood sugar roller coaster all day long. You eat a meal high in carbs, it drives your blood sugar up. The body dramatically drops that blood sugar and that immediately makes you hungry again. And so this is what's going on. If you feel like you ate and like shortly after you ate, you still feel hungry or within two hours, you feel hungry again. And you're like, why do I feel hungry? I just had this huge meal. It also is what can happen when you feel like you maybe have like a stereotypical reaction. You have like a uh, sushi or something, um, you know, a Asian meal that's really high in carbs that is low in fat. This can happen as well too. So it drives blood sugar up really quickly. And then you feel hungry again in a couple of hours because this is the blood sugar roller coaster. Again, the drop in blood sugar is what stimulates your body to feel hungry again. It's kind of an emergency really if your body can't burn fat and keep that stable blood sugar because if it drops too quickly, too low, and then it's really dangerous for your health, right? And you could go into a coma. And so this is why that that uh, signal is there is to drive your, your hunger, get you to eat some more. And then in this case too, when you're on that blood sugar roller coaster, the craving, the hunger that you have is going to be a combination, you know, craving and hunger. And it's going to drive you to eat some more carbohydrates, some very simple carbohydrates that are easy to digest and get that blood sugar to go back up again. And so I was on that before. Who have you, who, who's with us that remembers that? So, um, so somebody saying, uh, I don't know who they are. 20 grams of carbs a day is too little. Um, I haven't even talked about that yet. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the thing to know is that our body actually can make um, its own glucose to keep our blood sugar stable. Our liver is really, really good at that. And so it ends up being the one non-essential macronutrient. So we do need proteins. We need fats because our body can't make those. Uh, it can't make the, the building blocks of those, right? So it can't make amino acids and it can't make fatty acids, but it can make uh, carbohydrates to keep our blood sugar stable. So um for some, this is not for everybody, but again, this is the topic we're talking about here is uh, how is it that you can eat everything you want and still uh, lose weight? So um, now there may be people that have been lean and thin their whole lives and don't have an issue with what they feel like is portion control or being overweight. The, the news for you is, is that all these things that I'm covering are already healthy and working the way that they should and they're not out of balance. You're not experiencing metabolic um, dysfunction. And so again, not everybody needs to do a, a keto approach for um, healing their metabolic health. So uh, that's fine. If you think that's too little, then this show is probably not for you. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. But uh, we'll, uh, we're, we're talking to some other specific people that do ch have challenges with this. So uh, okay, so the blood sugar um, roller coaster. So some things that impact that blood sugar roller coaster and that can put you on that blood sugar roller coaster. Um, refined, simple carbohydrates, like I said, especially if your body's not metabolically flexible, that it can actually burn fat. Um, and also alcohol can do this. So when we drink alcohol, it actually suppresses. So I just mentioned too, that our liver actually will make glucose to keep our blood sugar stable. But what happens when we're drinking alcohol is that it suppresses the liver's ability to make blood sugar and to keep that steady balance. And to compensate for that, guess what happens? Our body gets hungry. We want to get some more food in. Uh, so this is maybe something you recognize where if you've had some alcohol, your inhibitions are lower and you, you start craving some kind of carbohydrate or maybe some highly palatable food combination of carbs and fat. And so this is, um, so the alcohol actually can drive that blood sugar roller coaster to uh, start as well. Um, even, even when you're fat adapted or fat burning and in ketosis, alcohol also can start the blood sugar roller coaster too. And Okay, so that one's number two is a blood sugar roller coaster impacting appetite and satiety. Now, number three, this one is really frustrating for a lot of people is that when you lose weight, so when you lose fat, you reduce your total body mass. Guess what that does? Research shows that it does two things. It actually increases your hunger hormones and it slows your metabolic rate. Okay, so we're not really talking so much in this show about 
metabolic rate. But this is a combination because your body doesn't want to lose weight. It's so sad. We work so hard and we put so much effort into this. Your body is not a fan of losing weight. It works so hard to try to get you to regain the weight. So how many of you out there have followed any number of diets and you lose weight, but you gain back even more? Guess what? It's your body. It's not your fault. You're not weak-willed. It's your body that's working against you. And so legit research shows this, that when you've lost weight, you lower your body weight total to compensate for that. Those hunger hormones that we talked about turn up. So even if two people started the same, let's say they start at the same weight and you got the same hunger hormones, this person loses weight, their hunger hormones go up higher than they were before they were at the same weight. So this person is a lower weight, but their hunger is higher than this person over here. And of course, it's really, really difficult to keep the weight off then. So we always believe this lie that if we just lose the weight, that'll motivate us to keep it off. But guess what? Your body's working against you really, really hard. It's turning that hunger hormone because it's like, no, 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 you need to eat and gain that weight back. So here is another reason why keto ends up being so much more powerful for people is that research shows that being in ketosis, following a keto diet for weight loss actually decreases that hunger hormone turning on. And so this is a really cool situation where when people have followed keto, low carb for a while, experienced that weight loss, it actually protects against regaining the weight somewhat. Now, I have a lot of clients that will work with me and then go off on their own and come back and say, hey, the weight's starting to come back on. Uh, I need to reboot and get back on track. I'm craving carbs and overeating them. Um, I'm eating unhealthy processed foods and so on and so forth. So it doesn't make it so that it's impossible to regain the weight. But guess what? If your hunger is much lower after you followed keto and lost some weight, how much easier is it going to be to not regain all the weight again compared to all those other diets that you've tried? And so there's some research in, oh, I think year 2004, and it's called the A to Z diet study where they looked at Atkins zone. And then I think they looked at uh, some diet in the middle. Um, zone. Oh, um, I think it's um, a very low fat diet. So they compared three different diets. And I remember finding this when I was in grad school. And this was mind blowing at the time, because this is one where like, you know, we've got to have low fat. And, you know, Atkins had fallen out of fashion as far as uh, so basically keto is just the modern version that we know more research about it that we call an Atkins diet that we used to have in favor back in the 90s and before. And so this research actually showed that when those people that followed one of those three diets, zone, which is kind of thought to be a more moderate approach, a balanced approach of carbs, fats, and protein, then a low, low fat, I think it might be Pritkin, I can't remember exactly, maybe somebody will, I'll, I'll look it up later. Um, so Pritkin is a basically a high carb, uh, low fat diet, and then Atkins, which is known as a uh, low carb, high fat diet. And so they found that when people followed an Atkins diet, their health markers improved more than the other two, and they were also able to keep the weight off for longer than the other two. Now, at the time, it was just mind-boggling because we thought low-carb low was like bad for you. How is this possible? How did everything in their body improve when they're following this unhealthy, high-fat diet? Well, now we know we have so much more research that, since then about the things that are going on. And so on the topic of being able to eat all that you want and not gain the weight, gain weight or still lose. Um, this is, we know now that because being in that state of ketosis and losing weight under that umbrella prevents your hunger hormone from increasing as much as it does on other dietary interventions. And so that's part of why it helps protect people from regaining the weight as fast as other weight loss attempts. Um, pretty cool, huh? And all right. So that was number one, two, three, four, One, two, three. That was number three. Okay, sorry. I've got these on a... Oh, it's Roman numerals. I know how to count those. What am I doing here? Okay, so that was number three uh, or number four. Sorry, gosh. Number four, weight loss. And so number five thing that impacts your hunger, cravings, and appetite is going to be sensory stimuli. So we are wired to eat food, okay? If you haven't figured that out, most of us, if you see food, you want to eat it. Have you had an experience where you weren't even hungry, weren't even thinking about something, but you saw a commercial for something, and all of a sudden, like, that's all you can think of, you can't get out of your mind? Well, the food manufacturers, the advertisers, they know that, so that's why they show those foods, and they also show number seven that we'll talk about, too, mirror neurons, 
they show somebody consuming that thing will make you crave it even more. So when you combine multiple things of this, you're, you're, uh, you're on a blood sugar roller coaster. You've just lost some weight. Your hunger hormones are increased. And then you get the, the commercial for the burger and you seeing somebody eating it. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is a recipe for like, I need to go get it now. Right? So the more of these things, so these are the things we're talking about are all these are not in your conscious control. None of these are in your conscious control. They're just things that happen in your body. You have zero control over. Um, so you may be like, I'm just going to, I'm going to white knuckle it. I'm trying really hard. The motivation to lose the weight is there. Um, but all these things are working behind, behind the scenes and they're not in your favor. And the more of these you combine, the recipe is disaster. Rest, rest, it's a recipe for disaster. So, um, so sensory stimuli, this means seeing hearing, smelling, tasting, not so much feeling food. Okay. But that's a sense. Okay. So especially those four things, anytime you cue that up, that just increases appetite, hunger, and cravings, all of that decreases satiety. You're no longer satisfied. And so, so for my clients, one of the things that's really important in the beginning, so yes, they are making a very, very big change to their dietary approach, but in all the things that I'm teaching you here today, I'm hoping you'll see how powerful it is when you can actually harness these things to your favor and actually get use all of this to your favor. So once you know that when you see food and you smell it and you hear it, you're going to want it like 10 times more and your willpower is not going to be enough to resist it. So this means avoiding things that give you a sensory stimuli of foods that you're trying to avoid, things that are highly palatable that make you overeat them and crave them and put you on the blood sugar roller coaster. Okay. So for me in the very beginning, and again, when I started keto diet, I didn't share this in this episode, but I started because I'd been in a terrible car accident. I had a traumatic brain injury. I had this pain syndrome in my legs that were causing me to not be able to walk or sit. And I was so desperate. I did not start keto for weight loss, but when I did, I found out that it was really, really powerful for that. And so I, but I had not been good at following diets in the past. And because of all these appetite things I'm talking about, anytime I tried to le eat less, I became immediately 10 times hungrier. <laughs> I was never able to stick with anything for very long to get very good results. So I was afraid I was going to fail when I started keto. So I, everything I'd ever studied about all this I'm teaching you, the hunger, appetites, and cravings, I wanted to maximize my possibility of success. So I applied everything I'd ever learned to it. I'm like, I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at this and develop an approach that makes it so that I can be the most successful because I was tired of being laid up in bed and uh, not being able to work and being in such pain and having no energy and brain fog. And the list of symptoms is a mile long. So I was desperate. I was so desperate. I'm like, I'm going to throw everything at this. So the change, some of the changes that I made then, I used to love to watch cooking shows I stopped that because I noticed that as soon as I started watching a cooking show, I suddenly was just craving and hungry for the foods they were cooking. I also, one of my pastimes was every evening I would go through the bakery section at the local grocery store and just peruse that. And I literally would look at everything and go, is that what my body's craving tonight? Is that what my body's craving? And so I stopped walking through the bakery section, stopped walking down the bread aisle, stopped walking down the chips aisle, the cookie aisle, you know all the processed food parts of the store. And it really dramatically impacts your ability to have control over your appetite and food choices. So again, sensory stimuli, seeing, hearing, smelling, or even tasting. So don't even sample stuff. So this is a, maybe a pitfall people fall into too, is like, well, I'll just have a little tiny bit of it and then I'll be okay. Then I'll be satisfied. Guess what? That's all of them combined. And so that just basically makes it impossible for you to actually uh, feel satiety and not hungry anymore. And so avoid the sensory stimuli. It burns out your willpower. Um, and uh, well, this is a good place to actually talk about this willpower myth, right? So again, how many of you have uh, started a weight loss program and you're like, this time, this time is going to be different because when I lose the weight, that's going to motivate me to keep going. I will just use my willpower. I'm, I'm going to do it this time. <sighs> Guess what? The, most, the people that are the most successful at changing their habits, losing weight and keeping it off, are the ones that are not relying on willpower. So research actually shows that when you constantly put yourself in situations where you're getting the sensory stimuli from these foods that make you crave them and overeat them, you actually, willpower burns out really, really quickly. And the people that are the most successful, they don't rely on willpower. They actually 
set up their environment so that they're not getting the sensory stimuli. They don't keep those foods in their house so that they're readily accessible. Uh, accessible. They don't spend their time looking at the bakery section going like, oh my gosh, I've missed that. Uh, might even have to go so far as to change your job. If you work at a bakery, it might be better if you go work at a tomato factory or, <laughs> or something like that instead. Uh, tomato factory. All right. Hopefully you find that funny. Um, so don't try to rely on willpower because if you do, you're actually setting yourself up for uh, sabotaging your results. Set up your environment, your world to minimize those sensory uh, stimuli. Okay, so that's number five. <coughs> Excuse me. Five things that affect uh, in our body, things that affect our appetite and appetite regulation. And so number six is habitual patterns. Okay, this is really, I just, I nerd out on this stuff. Thank you for letting me share it with you. I hope you enjoy all this information too. So habitual patterns, I kind of call these autopi autopilot cravings or craving triggers or appetite cr triggers. And this is because a long time ago, and well, it's not even that long ago, food was pretty scarce. It was hard to get enough nutrients, enough calories. And so our brain is wired to memorize where we got foods in nature. So imagine a time there's no grocery stores. You had to go out and hunt or scavenge any of the foods that you got. And so it would be very beneficial for your, your brain to memorize the time of the year, the time of the day, what path you took, what the leaves looked like around at you when you found those berries or that honey, or you found uh, the good place to go hunting for some game. So we still have all this residual. And the way this shows up for people, they struggle with maybe like an evening craving, right? Um, a lot of my ladies come in and they're like, well, I'm used to just, they're really busy. They work, work full time. They take care of their family. They wear a thousand hats in their life. And so usually the evening is the one time that they get to themselves. Um, so it might mean that they have a dessert or some snacks, uh, have a glass of wine or two or, or another drink. And this is the time where their brain is memorized that as soon as dinner's done and you put the dishes in the sink or whatever you do and you sit in that chair, ooh, that's when we get those highly rewarding foods in our brain. And so dopamine has memorized, has taught your brain to memorize everything about that situation because that was the harvest of those high reward foods that got the reward. So be mindful then of, and this, this also, here's another example of how this shows up is that when you walk into a movie theater, if you've always gotten the popcorn and the snacks and the candies and things when you go to the movie theater, you're going to walk in and the, the cravings feel overwhelming, right? Where, why is this coming on? It's because your brain, first of all, you're getting the sensory stimuli. You're getting the, the smell of the popcorn. They do that on purpose to you. Sorry to tell you, they do that on purpose. And but then also just the environment, right? Like, oh, because every time in the past when we walked into this movie theater, that's been the bountiful harvest of high calorie foods. So what that does is as soon as you hit that same, the starting pattern of this, um, the, the cue that triggers this whole autopilot thing is that is when the dopamine starts to rise in your brain and dopamine drives your behavior to do something. So again, this isn't willpower. This isn't well, I know better. This isn't the logical part of your brain. This is the part of your brain that just drives your behavior and actions. And so if, you, if you're if you doing well with habit change and you're eating healthier foods, but then you find there's certain times of the day, places, situations, but also emotions can trigger this as well. Because if when you've been stressed or you're upset or you feel abandoned or whatever it is that your specific emotional triggers are, and you've always used food to comfort and soothe yourself... Emotions also can be the same trigger. The, dr the dopamine drives up and it's like, hey, you know how you always cope with this is a, is a cup of Ben and Jerry's. That's the best coping mechanism. And again, when you start that cue of this autopilot, this, uh, autopilot craving appetite, it's really, really hard to stop once you've cued that. So once you're in that loop, it's really, really hard to stop it. So some of the work that I do with my, my clients is helping them kind of unravel what's that whole pattern where, where can we go back to before it even starts? And we want to change what you do so you don't even cue that first part of it, right? So some of my ladies, for example, they always sit in their chair or their end of the couch in the evening when they eat their snacks and have their wine or whatever they're doing. And so what we do is we have them sit in a different chair. We move their chair or we have them go, go in the, ev go in the evening and go in the bedroom and watch TV or read a book. Um, 
do something else, but even sitting in a totally different place is a big key because when you're shaking up the routine, you're doing something different than you've always done, your brain actually shifts to the more conscious part of the brain because it says, oh, well, this is something we haven't done before. I need to pay attention because I need to be alert and awake and make choices in the situation because it's not this autopilot thing I've done before. So that's just an example of how you can change that. Um, and again, so that's number number six is habitual patterns. Again, so watch out for time, place, situations, emotional triggers. Um, there's a lot of work to do here, right? Okay, so number seven, things that uh, affect appetite regulation are going to be mirror neurons. This is a really cool thing. Um, all animals, humans are animals, all animals on this planet, we're wired to copy the behavior of the other animals that we're hanging around that we can see. This is a really fun thing on, if you ever watch like TikTok videos, you can kind of see that like animals will mimic their, their uh, owner's behaviors. You know, have you seen the cat or the dog that the owner has a hurt leg and they're walking on crutches or they're limping and then the animal behind them will adopt that same limping behavior? Well, it's, it's fascinating. Another fun little thing you can do too is if you have a, a very young baby in your life, go to the baby and just stick your tongue out repeatedly at the baby and eventually it will, it will mimic your behavior as well. It's pretty fascinating. Very, very young as long as they can see you. So several months old is typically when they can start to get this, uh, you can see this behavior. So it's it's what makes birds all flock together. They're basically literally copying the behavior of the bird in front of them. So there's tons of examples in nature of this where it comes in with appetite control uh, and food choices, habit change, is that we will copy the behavior of anyone we're around. And so this is why when you go to the Mexican restaurant and they put the chips on the table and everybody starts eating the chips, you maybe even notice that like, your hand is going toward the chip bowl and you didn't even consciously know it was doing it. So mirror neurons act from our brain right to our muscles. They don't even, they don't even stop at the part of the brain that makes a choice. And so this can be really frustrating, but it also can be really empowering. So this is part of why it's so important to have a community of people that you hang out with that are doing the same thing that you're doing. Now, we've all been in a situation where like, oh my gosh, like I've been really good and I'm following my eating habits, but then you go out with friends and they're doing something that you're like, oh, it's not really what I should be doing right now, but like, okay, I can't resist. And then you beat yourself up the next day. And so being very conscientious of putting yourself not in those positions that everybody's eating the foods that you want to avoid um, and spending your time with people that are eating the foods that you do want to adopt. All right. So um, this again, this kind of ties back into where I was saying that like food manufacturers and advertisements for the foods they want you to overeat, they will show somebody consuming it because guess what? It doesn't have to be in li live in person that you're seeing that person doing it. It can be a picture. It can be on video. And so they're using that knowledge. How do they know more than your doctor, your dietitian, your nutritionist? How do those food manufacturers know more about what makes you eat and crave and feel hungry for certain foods than anyone's ever taught anyone else. So uh, this is something, actually mirror neurons is something, a concept that I learned from uh, Dr. Joan Ifland. And one of the conferences that I was at, she was talking about how this uh, is used, how we can use it to our favor. And so this is one of the most important things of being able to make long-term change uh, in uh, dietary healthy eating is because is having a group of people around us that are following the same habits, you know, spending time with them. So that's why for my clients, we do Zoom meetings. We've got several of them every week that people can attend. And that way you can see the people that are successful that are doing the habits that you'd like to do as well. So cool concept and um, one that's often missed in, except for the food manufacturers, they know, they know. All right, so that's number seven. Uh, number eight thing that affects appetite regulation is going to be highly palatable foods. Now, this, this concept I learned from uh, Dr. Stefan Guiané, uh, researcher out of Washington State. Um, he's studied a lot. He studies obesity and um, what it is in our brain that makes us overeat and gain weight. And uh, really, really fascinating research that he's done. So I learned this concept from him. Um, it's called highly palatable foods foods. So these are foods, they can be things that exist in nature, which I'll talk about. There's probably only two of them. Things that are three, uh, things that exist in nature, but they're most often in created foods by humans. So highly palatable is anything that's fat and carbs together, 
but it also can be just fat and sweet. So even if it's not actual sugar, if it's an artificial sweet sweetener, fat and sweet flavored together are a trigger for us to be hungrier and to have very low appetite. So it makes us eat a lot. So these, this food combo, so let's just do this mental experiment. Okay, think of a pile of butter. <laughs> How much of that by itself could you eat? Eh, <laughs> probably not very much, right? Pile of sugar. How much of that could you eat by itself? Now mix them together. Fat and sweet together. Oh, we've just made frosting. <laughs> How much of that can you make? Add white flour to it as well, another refined carbohydrate. We've got fat, we've got two kinds of carbohydrates together, we're gonna make some cookies, cakes, all baked goods are this combination of fat and sweet. And how many of you feel like, I can't control myself around those things, I always eat more. The other thing is if you've had a nice healthy meal as well, you've had your steak and broccoli or whatever, and then the dessert cart rolls around, you're suddenly have, have plenty of room for have, to have a dessert as well too. So the, this combination of foods, it hijacks your appetite, it hijacks your satiety. We are wired to consume as much of those foods as possible. So all junk food, almost all frozen foods in the grocery store are this combination. And again, this is something, guess who knows this and we don't know this, that combination is specifically, we're, we're geared to eat as much of that as possible. So my theory on where this comes from is that the original food that all humans, well, some, some humans consume is breast milk. And it's high in carbs and high in fat. And so my theory is that we're wired that way because when we're very young, we need to be able to consume that as much as possible so that we can gain weight, get fat, and survive babyhood. And so there aren't very many things in nature that exist besides breast milk. Um, so, uh, I mean, cow's milk as well. So can regular cow's milk, for a lot of people, they love that and they can overconsume that. Um, also... Nuts and seeds are actually a combination. So even though they don't taste sweet, they're high in carbs and fat together. And so that's why, how many of you have trouble with like, oh my gosh, I can't resist peanut butter, uh, I can't stop eating it. Or if you get your big costco sides bag of nuts, that you can't stop eating that as well too. And then what do they do with nuts as well? They start roast them and toast them and add sugary flavors on top of them. So that's why those things are really hard for us to regulate. And also any other combination of that that I said as well, the baked goods, the cookies, the, 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 the chocolate confections, you know, that's what a lot of people say like, oh my gosh, I love chocolate. Well, chocolate is fat and carbs together. Um, nobody's going to go eat pure cocoa cacao by itself without any sweetener in it. So it's, it's the highly palatable combo that you like. It's not specifically that. So, um, Oh, we're getting some comments here. Sorry, I have my notes up, so I missed the comments. So Facebook users saying, uh, I have in the past made it three weeks into every single weight loss program that exists. Willpower is not a good crutch at all. Yes, so true. That was always my experience as well, is that, uh, you know, I, and, and good for you, because I think I could make it maybe two weeks at the most. I mean, sometimes it was like half a day, and then I'm like, I can't do this. I just feel so hungry. I never, I remember doing uh, Jenny Craig and the portion of the food, it was like half a can of soup and half a sandwich was like one meal. And I'm like, there's no way. I can't just not eat that much. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I'm glad you're here. And so I think a Facebook user is showing you like that because I think if you're in, the, I think you're in the Facebook group and you have to give permission for it to show your name. Um, so if you want to type your name or if you want to remain anonymous, that's totally up to you. So thanks for being here. Uh, Andrea says, you're making so much sense. Uh, I think we should talk Carol. Oh, yes, well, uh, would love that. Love that. Um, and I'm just getting started too. <laughs> um, okay. So highly palatable foods concept. Um, that was number eight things that hijack our appetite. And, you know, and I just want to acknowledge too, because so many of us in the world, the, the message for weight loss is about, well, just have portion control, just have some self-control, just go exercise more and eat less. This is what everyone thinks they should be doing, but guess what happens? Remember how I talked about with weight loss, you actually increases your hunger hormones. Same thing happens for a lot of people when they exercise, you just created a calorie deficit. So your body turns on your hunger hormones. This was always the case for me. If I, I'm going to exercise and I'm going to lose the weight and I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to get in shape, right? Which is what we, what we say when we just really want to lose fat. And you exercise turns on your hunger hormones. And guess what? You just eat back everything that you just burned off and then some more. And so 
a highly palatable food combo. So this is, it's a lie that we're told. And I, I, I'm apologize on behalf of all the, the, the weight loss programs and things out there is that, and the doctors and the nurses and the nutritionists that mean well, that mean well, right? They don't know any better. They haven't studied all this. They don't know that everything they're telling you is impossible. Just eat less and exercise more. Um, so you've actually got to get all of this stuff, everything we're talking about here, you've got to address all of that so that you can eat less, eat less naturally. I'm a re really big fan of like, let's address all of this so that your appetite is nice and low and you don't obsess about food. You don't have cravings. Then it's easy. It's easy to eat less when you're not fighting all this stuff that's working against you. Um, okay. So highly puddled foods, very, I, very, really cool concept too. So um, that's number eight. Eight. And next up is number nine, which is going to be refined foods. And so this is going to be, typically it's going to be things that have refined carbohydrates in there. So it's going to be things that are sugar and, uh, and or highly refined things like flours, starches, but also this is going to be soda, regular soda, and even juices. And so juices are refined because they've taken out the fiber and all that's left is the pure carbohydrate, pure sugar. So refined foods as well, they will de increase appetite, decrease satiety, and make you hungry. And then also most of those as well. And again, these are all interrelated because guess what happens when you eat a lot of refined foods, refined carbohydrate foods? You get on the blood sugar roller coaster. So you eat some, you're hungry again and within two hours. Then you eat more and you feel so guilty and and. Why did I do that again? I know better, but then your blood sugar drops and it's a vicious cycle. All right, so refined foods is uh, number nine. And number 10 is actually, I'm gonna talk about how the different macronutrients affect your appetite and uh, satiety. And so macronutrients, um, often you may, if you're in the keto world, you might know that the short word for macronutrients is macros. And basically it's just a cat, it's short for proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. So those are macronutrients that uh, humans need. And we talked about just a bit ago, too, about how um, carbohydrates are the only category of macronutrients that are non-essential, meaning we don't actually have to eat any of them to stay alive. You might have seen some of these people out there that are eating 100% carnivore diet, so they eat 100% meat, and they're not only alive, but they're thriving. So it can be a hard concept for people to wrap their brain around, the fact that carbohydrates are totally optional. And the reason for that is because... If you, again, think back before we had grocery stores and mass-produced food, is that carbohydrates were some of the hardest food things to come by. So if we were required to eat carbohydrates to stay alive, we would have died off a long time ago. So our body developed these mechanisms in order to be able to stay alive, despite, it, you know, in times when there was zero carbohydrates available in our, in our environment. And so this is why we can live without them. And so they end up being an optional thing that were available rarely, you know, uh, honey harvest that was out, um, wild berries that were available late summer, and uh, maybe some roots and squashes. But again, if we go back, you know, 100 years, those things were really, really tiny. We weren't getting a lot of our nutrients from, from those. Um, now, if you live closer to the equator, um, fruits were uh, much more abundant. Um, and so, but those are also in their natural state. So the fruits that are closer to the equator, they have a lot of fiber in them naturally as well too. So, um, so we, uh, okay. So, um, macronutrients and okay. So protein, let's talk about protein, low protein intake increases your hunger, decreases ap appetite, or I'm sorry, decreases satiety and increases appetite. And specifically, weirdly, it makes us want to eat those uh, carbohydrate rich foods as well, specifically the highly palatable ones. So um, like I mentioned, protein is essential and it's because of the building blocks of protein or amino acids. And we can't make those in our body. Uh, there are nine of them that we can't make in our body anyway. So some of them we can make um, uh, in some circumstances. But anyways, there's nine of them that we can't make in our body. So we have to get them from food. And there is this really cool hypothesis out there right now. It's called the protein leveraged hypothesis. And the, this hypothesis says that our appetite is primarily driven by the goal of getting adequate protein to stay alive and healthy. And when we under eat protein, it increases our appetite overall because our body's just still trying to meet that protein goal. And I, we, we, we have an a adequate protein goal for our keto ladies. And this is one thing that's probably changed in time for the good. And most keto approaches out there is that we used to 
do moderate, don't get too much protein now, but we've actually found out that more protein is usually better and it's really good for appetite regulation as well. So when you're under eating protein, you're just going to be hungry all day long. So if you think about a food like, um, you know, a highly palatable, uh, let's say, let's just say pizza. Pizza is actually very low in protein, high in carbs, high in fat. Oh gosh, there's that highly palatable combo again. And if our desire, if, if we have a protein uh, thermostat or, or not a thermostat, but like a, a, a gauge in our, in our body somewhere imaginary, where it's like, well, we need to get 100 grams of protein during the day, but we're just going to eat pizza. You're going to eat lots and lots and lots of pizzas. Your body's trying to get enough protein to stay alive and healthy. And so it contributes to overall eating too much. And so um, this is going to be, this is a hint at one of the, the five steps that I'm going to talk about, about how to actually naturally regulate your appetite so that you can eat as much as you want and lose weight. And so protein... Um, and we're chronically under eating protein. I see this all the time. And especially it's it's weird because protein rich foods, stereotypically, for some reason, they've been stereotyped, stereotyped as man foods, you know, steak and eggs and burgers. Those are man foods and women need to eat salads and grains and quinoa and fruit, right? Well, guess what? Really, really need protein. We can, we can do a whole show just on the protein. So anyways, low protein intake, dramatically increases your overall food intake. And so uh, the second macronutrient we're going to talk about then is carbohydrates. Now, specifically refined carbohydrates like we've talked about as well, which is sugar, flours, starches, soda, and juices put you on that blood sugar roller coaster. So consuming refined carbohydrates increases appetite, decreases satiety, makes you consume more overall. Um, and then liquid fat. So fat as it exists in nature, you know, the fat that's in your steak, the fats that's in the avocado, those actually are um, actually can help promote satiety, decrease appetite. But when we liquefy it, we make high fat coffee, we put cream in our coffee, too much, that actually bypasses our satiety cues and doesn't give us any satiety at all. And because fat is so high in calories, it makes it really, really easy to overconsume it. So I recommend avoiding all liquid fat calories if you're trying to lose weight naturally. Because guess what? It doesn't give you any satiety. Um, tastes good. It gives you pleasure and enjoyment. But it's not going it to, all it's going to give you basically is empty calories. So, all right. So here's the part you've been really waiting for. Here's my five steps. So, I mean, if you want to take a really, really, really big leap, let's talk. Um, I work with clients only by application only. Um, but uh, here, if, if you're just kind of like, I'm in a baby step mode and I want to kind of know the, the things I should do, I'm going to give you the five steps that I'd recommend that you take to get yourself uh, to the point that you can, um, you know, so again, this is the promise of these five steps, how to hack your appetite so that you can eat as much as you want when you're hungry, feel satisfied so that you stop when you're full, have control over food, you're not food obsessed anymore, you're not fighting your cravings or coping with the cravings all day so that you can lose weight naturally. All right. So step one, this is probably the hardest one, <laughs> accept and embrace the fact that there are certain foods, situations are going to trigger your biological appetite at the subconscious level that no amount of willpower can overcome. All right. Now we all want the fantasy of like, I want to be able to eat anything in the world I want to eat like everyone else does. I want to be able to eat anything. So there are some foods that are just going to be impossible to be able to eat in a way that you can self-regulate. Research shows that people that are the most successful at avoiding overeating those foods are the ones that don't put themselves in those situations, okay? So embracing the fact that you want to avoid those situations and the stimuli and all that stuff that we talked about. So you don't have them in your house. Avoid those places and situations. Begin to notice. All right, so that's step one is acknowledgement, accepting. Uh, this isn't an AA meeting, but what's the, um, what's the phrase about, like, God, give me the wisdom. Uh, no. Give me the power to accept what I can't change. Is that right? Who knows the phrase? <laughs> so basically, you got to accept. Number one is you got to accept that there's some things you're powerless over. And so step number two you can go through these steps as slow or as fast as you want, okay? So step number two, make sure you're getting adequate protein, okay? Really important. It's going to make it so that you stabilize that blood sugar roller coaster. It's going to 
decrease your appetite because you're meeting your protein goal. Now, this varies from person to person. Um, I would recommend to start with aiming for 25 to 30 grams of protein at every single meal, especially breakfast. Breakfast in this country usually is all carbs, or people skip it and just have coffee, right? So breakfast, 25 to 30 grams of carbs, if you're not sure what that is. It's kind of the size of the palm of your hand of most uh, animal-based protein sources, deck of cards. Um, and also don't eat any snacks unless you add a protein to it. So get in that habit of every time you eat protein first, eat that first, it's going to dramatically reduce your appetite right there for all those other things. It's magic. I've got a mosquito in here. Okay, step number three. Again, these are progressive if you want to. El eliminate white things. And this is just basically a way of thinking about refined carbohydrate foods. And so some of these aren't, aren't white, so don't, you know, don't come at me. But um, so sugar, flour, starches, bread, tortillas, chips, pasta, soda, juices, all of those, they're going to put you on the blood sugar roller coaster um, because they're refined. They don't give you any satiety. All right, so that's step three. You ready for three? Which step are you on? Okay, so step four, begin to notice, observe yourself. What are the times of day? What are the places, the situations? What are the people or emotions or even specific foods that turn on cravings and appetite? The things that make you feel like you don't have any control and you have no off switch. So just begin to notice those. How do they affect you? And how then can you begin to minimize exposure to those things? And then step five, step five, consider, consider a keto diet the way that I teach it, okay? Because I do it differently. One of the things that is so different about mine is that I do, because I know all of this about appetite regulation, behavior change, satiety, craving cues, mirror neurons, because I know all about that stuff. My approach encompasses all of that. So it's not just about like eat 20 less, 20 less carbs, as much protein, as much fat, have a good day. Oh, we got all this wrapped up in there. Okay. So it addresses all of those nine things that contribute to overall involuntary eating and weight gain. So another problem is that all these keto products are coming on the market, right? They're, they're, designed to resemble the carby version of it, but because they have the fat in there and then they have artificial sweetener in there, you overeat those as well. They aren't doing you any favors. And also then the, the white versions of the keto products on the market, I got bad news for you. They aren't keto. You know, the bread and the tortillas that you're buying, they cause the same impact your blood sugar as regular ones. And this is because nobody regulates that word keto. You probably taste it and you're like, this is too good to be true. I can't believe this is keto. It's not. It's not. Check your blood sugar after you've eaten it. You'll find out the hard truth is that it's not. And it's because nobody regulates the word keto on products. Anybody literally, you could have a bag of sugar and put the word keto friendly on it and nobody's going to arrest you. All right. So, um, yeah, it, it's based on my experience. Like I said a little bit ago that when I started this, I was so desperate just to get well and heal my brain that I developed this kitchen sink approach that just really is remarkable. So the people that I'm working with, a lot of them are, hey, I've tried to start keto on my own and I just can't figure it out. I'm confused. I'm overwhelmed. Like everybody says all these different things. I work with those ladies. And I also work with ladies that they've tried it on their own and they got some results or maybe no results, or they started to gain the weight back by all these things that we talked about or why they fall off it and start to gain the weight back. So because my approach is so unique, so different, so comprehensive, what works so well. So my clients all report they're just blown away by the fact that they don't have any cravings. They don't crave sugar anymore. I've worked with so many self-proclaimed sugar addicts that go through this and they're just like, I can't believe it's the first time in my life I don't feel like I'm controlled by sugar cravings. Appetite control as well and just freedom from food obsession. So how are you how are you how are you feeling now? Which one which one you know, give me a number of which one you think blew your mind. I don't know. You may not be able to remember which of the numbers were. So just again, in recapping all this, we've been talking about how to eat all you want and lose weight and still lose weight. Well, the trick is that you've got to address all the things that make us overeat in the first place. And when you address those, then 
You get to eat when you're hungry. You can eat as much as you want when you're hungry. And you will stop eating because you're satisfied when your body's got enough nutrients. And that's what helps you lose weight. All right. So there's my trick. <laughs> um, all right. So if you like what you heard today, again, visit my website. I'll put my website up here for you. Check it out. You can actually read so much more about my story, a lot of success stories of the ladies I've worked with. There's a ton of information on there. And so ketocarol.com. Carol has an E on the end. It's the very fancy French spelling of Carol. And you can apply to work with me more closely there if you'd like to join a um, very comprehensive program and support. But also, hey, I just put together, if you're not ready for that big of a step, I actually just put together a free ebook. It's basically the 10 rules that I have my clients follow to get results. And it's called the, uh, the Keto Quick Start Formula. The 10 rules to follow to get into ketosis as fast as possible, to end cravings, and to maximize fat loss. And so if you want a copy of that, it's a 26-page 20, little ebook that's free, but you got to tell me you want it. Um, so find me on Instagram, at Keto Carol on Instagram. You can send me a direct message. And also there is a reel that I posted on there. It's a pink background. If you go to my um, feed page, I think that's what it's called. If you go to my feed page, you can see a reel that I've got pinned on there that says that I've got that. And if you comment on there or, again, send me a DM, then I will follow up and send you a copy of that. So, all right. Hey, everyone. It's been so awesome that you've been here. I appreciate it. I hope you learned a ton. I love teaching. And hopefully this is going to impact your life. And we'll see you all next time. This has been episode 59 of Keto Chat for Women. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon. Bye now.